So from temporal to eternal, that's my message for you today, brethren, because we have um, these temporal lives and these temporal bodies. We're supposed to be walking to the eternal. Last Sabbath, I think, we started a message last week with the same theme as I want to start today. It's Exodus 14, where we find the account of the house of Israel passing through the Red Sea. Now, uh, there is no scriptural evidence, but the Church of God, as well as the Jewish tradition of the Midrash, they have taught for the, that this event of the crossing of the Red Sea happened on the last day of Unleavened Bread. And that event directly relates to the meaning and purpose of the Days of Unleavened Bread, indeed, the event of passing through the Red Sea. However, there is something else more there than I think we need to glean from. So Exodus 14, verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before Pihahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the, hand, by the land. The wilderness has crossed them in. Now, friends, this reveals that the children of Israel were following God's lead, you see, because whatever direction the cloud went, as you know, they were following, and they were unaware of where God was leading them. It also reveals that God knew exactly what he was doing and was in total control of the lives of not only the Israelites, leading them to the Red Sea, but also to the Egyptians, as we'll find out later. Now, according to the Jewish tradition, again, how, however much it might be worth, uh, but we can glean from the scripture that this might be so. According to the Jewish tradition, there were Egyptian spies among the Israelites who reported back to Pharaoh about their progress. Not only that, they also reported about their attitude and also what the direction they were leading. They were heading, actually. Now, to Pharaoh, though Pharaoh had let them go, in the back of his mind, he knew that eventually he would follow that he would punish and return the children of Israel to Egypt to serve not only him, but also the Egyptians. He was only bidding his time until it became most advantageous for him to pursue after them. Now God knew this, and he knew that he had spies among the Israelites. He did say that it would appear that they were wandering without purpose, and of course, as soon as they did, the spies ran back to Pharaoh and told him, so verse 4, Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart, God says, so that he will pursue them, and I'll gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So basically, brethren, they headed to the Red Sea. Though God hardens Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh did not need much encouragement. When God hardened Pharaoh's heart, what that really means, what it really meant, was that God took what Pharaoh already thought and he put it at the front of his mind so that it possessed him and that he would leave all thought and follow after the people. So God used that to accomplish his purpose and to teach not only the Israelites but also us very important lessons. Now the Israelites followed God. Oh, brethren, if they knew, <laughs> think about it. We know from the account of the mindset of many of them, and if they had known where God was leading them, oh, I don't think that they would have followed. So the spies, knowing the physical situation of the Israelites, ran to Pharaoh. Verse 5, Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled. So it was told, you know, who told him? That's interesting. That's why from the scriptures I said we glean this conclusion that indeed there were spies really from Egyptians uh, among, the, among the Israelites. So the heart of the Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why, why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. 
So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and to, overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihai Harot before Baal Zephon. Verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched up them. So uh, they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to God. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. So we see the reaction of the of the house of Israel to this situation and uh, we marvel kind of you know when we read this reaction we can become incredulous and wonder why they would even react in such a way well, after all you know had they not just witnessed ten plagues had they not just witnessed the firstborn of every household of Egypt die not only the people but all the animals they had observed the Passover and had left at night with a vigilant God watching over them. But God knew the Israelites and how they were torn between two minds. They still had one foot of their lives pointed back towards Egypt. With the other foot, they were timidly picking it up, you know. So, well, you know how we all, how we test water to see if it's too cool to get into. If it's too cold, you know, or is it, you know, too warm, or is it somewhere in the middle? So if we are truthful with ourselves, brethren, we can be the same. We can think the same. Yes, we are not standing in front of a physical Red Sea with the Egyptians there, but we can have our foot, you know, planted in our old way of thinking. We can even be actively involved in this world's ways. Meanwhile, we timidly put our foot into the Red Sea where God is leading and yes, we're all guilty of that, brethren. We're all guilty of it, whether in large ways or just little things in our lives. You see, choosing directions. Why did why did this happen to me? We can ask ourselves, why am I headed here? Oh, it was better back there. Why have I been led here? You know, we can think that way. We can think that way and we can, you know, we can be all uh, very much baffled by all kinds of uh, things happening in our lives and so on and so forth so you know we are not less guilty than Israelites you might say so God was so painfully aware of this among the Israelites and he is also aware of it in us it is just a natural thing for us you know to think that way therefore if you think about it for the Israelites standing before the Red Sea when they got to the other side and into the wilderness everything that happened to them was another red sea were they going to follow god or were they going to turn and look back at egypt and if you think about it brethren every day we are presented with the red sea why so that our father knows and we know of what mind we are we know ourselves and we know what we need to repent of. We know how much we need God's help. And from that, we also learn to trust him by looking at where he is leading, not as a cold stream we are just you know, tipping a foot into, but as solid rock. One meaning of the holidays, one of the holidays, which would be the unleavened bread, is that indeed, indeed, this uh, milestone of the Red Sea indeed represents for each of us the pivotal point of life. When we learn and live, one of the lessons we must learn. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. Exodus 14, verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again and no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Now God was telling Israel and us 
that this dilemma we keep placing ourselves in is futile. Now it is futile, brethren, for us to be looking to ourselves and to be looking backwards. The enemy we once served, the Pharaoh, the Israelites once served, were doomed. Finally, Israel at that moment in time walked forward. They looked at the rock, and we know from the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that it says that that rock was Christ. Christ was the one who led them through the sea. That's what it says also in the scriptures. Pharaoh was already defeated, you see. This world, brethren, is already defeated, and Satan is already defeated. Please turn to John 16, when Jesus Christ tells us about to have his peace. It is John 16, verse 33. John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have the tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, we don't have to be busy looking back at Egypt, right? and we can boldly walk into that Red Sea, though the enemy still is strong. Satan hasn't lost any of his power. You know, he is as powerful today as he was when he was leading Pharaoh. He is in pursuit of us every day, but he's already defeated. But he will not stop trying, of course. Now, even though Satan is already defeated, he continues and he can't win. You know, just like Pharaoh, he keeps trying to recapture us to serve him. But Satan is unable to capture us from God. The only way he can is if we turn our feet back to Egypt. If we stop trusting in God and trust in Pharaoh, trust in Satan. The only way Pharaoh could have had his slaves back was if the house of Israel would not have walked forward. And then Pharaoh would not have pursued them and he would not have been destroyed. Now Israel's salvation was, and our salvation is, to walk in faith in the direction that God is leading us. Please drop to in Exodus to chapter 14 and verse 15. Exodus 14, verse 15. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. You see, brethren, Israel did move forward, and God did as he promised. Drop to verse 30, Exodus 14, verse 30. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians deal sorry, the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Now, brethren, this event is the crux of our lives, if you would. The crux of our lives. Why? You may wonder why. Well, it is our choice, you see. It is the crucial choice. Israel after flesh, physical Israel, continually kept one foot pointed back to Egypt. They never learned to think differently. They faced the same crucial change in their thinking as do we every day. What God desires of us, brethren, of all of us, is to think differently. Instead of having one foot pointed toward the old way, and another pointed towards God's kingdom. He wants us to point both feet, our body, our face towards him. And not ever turn around to look back at what God has done and will destroy. This is not a new lesson. It was a new to Israel. Israel's forefathers and relatives had the same test. If you go to Genesis chapter 19, you will see that. Genesis 19 verse 23. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. What our Lord and God desires us to do is to stop thinking 
temporarily, temporary, temporarily, if you wish, and think eternally. If we continue to think temporarily, then our lives, brethren, will be temporal and they will end. If you remember Adam and Eve, they chose the temporal direction and God told them in Genesis 3 that their existence would be temporal. Genesis 3 verse 19, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. However, if we choose an eternal direction, we will receive life. Look at 1 John chapter 5 verse 19. 1 John chapter 5 verse 19 We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. In other words, under Satan, under Pharaoh, under the sway of Egypt. Verse 20 And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So our thinking must change from being temporal to eternal. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. It says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now the Greek word for temporary is proskairos, and in Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, it says that this word proskairos means temporarily conditioned, meaning a way of thinking suggested by the situation of the moment, or allowing each event in our lives to dictate how we live and how we react. Now, in Ecclesiastes, King Solomon defined the meaning of temporal, and uh, we find that definition right there in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is Vanity. The Hebrew word for vanity is hebel. It literally means breath or vapor. Connotatively, it conveys that physical life, brethren, is but a breath from ceasing. Therefore, physical life is futile. It is temporal. It is worth as much as a breath. It's worthless and it's fleeting. Now, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament goes on to state that temporal also means transitory, corruptible, or decay. Not only is our physical life transitory or corruptible, the, the, the entire universe, the entire creation is, Romans 8 verse 19, is transitory and corruptible. Romans 8 verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the re revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now, in the Jewish Encyclopedia, you can find it online, in JewishEncyclopedia.org, there is an article entitled Leaven. And in that article it says that leaven and corruption are regarded as synonyms, 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 synonyms terms, uh, synonyms uh, in the Hebrew language. The rabbis, in speaking of evil desire, called it the leaven that is in the dough. So the Jews, leaven and corruption to the Jews were exactly the same. Now, speaking of that, you know, yeast is the most common ingredient used today. To make bread and it can be bought in small packets and placed in bread to leaven it and make it rise now this that process is called fermentation fermentation is really another word for rotting it is corrupting as it is rotting and decaying from the yeast that is in it it is giving off alcohol again in wine in beer but also in bread as well as the air which makes the bread rise the yeast spreads through the bread quickly 
and eats the sugars and grows and multiplies throughout the dough. Within three to six hours, it rises to where you can make bread. Now, the Hebrews and other peoples of the Middle East were taught to use yeast, you wouldn't believe, by who? By the Egyptians, brethren. Oh, our God, of course, is an unbelievable God. Here are the people to whom is attributed the using of yeast in bread. Up until that time, most of the people of the Middle East ate flat bread, but the Egyptians taught them to use leavening around 2600 before Christ. And it was customary when baking to set aside a lump of dough to be used for leavening the next fresh dough. It is indeed what Paul referred to in First uh, Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6. When Paul tells them, your glorying is not good, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You know, it spreads quickly, brother. The analogy God conveys through our removing, you know, leaven from our homes and not eating leavened bread in those seven days during the uh, days of unleavened bread. The analogy is to rid ourselves from the corrupted physical temporal thinking of the world, taking our foot out of this world and turning and pursuing God's eternal thinking. Verse 7, therefore purge out uh, old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened for indeed Christ our pastor will sacrifice for us. So this is the passage that we all knew and we use that passage to uh, as a proof and indeed it is a proof that the Old Testament instructions are not the Old Testament only but that the church in the New Testament indeed practice them and uh, verse 8 and 9 and verse 7 here are a proof that the early apostolic church kept all the feasts including the days of unleavened bread but brethren this entire universe of which we are in awe and wonder is also temporal also all the pursuits of those of these on this earth are temporal as humans we often take ourselves too seriously sometimes we take ourselves too seriously and when we do that we think temporally Many people in the world strive for a legacy and we can get into politics, we can get into a lot of things where people want to leave their mark on the world, but we need to be different in our thinking indeed. In a, there is one poem that I ran across written in 1959 by Saxon White Kessinger entitled Indispensable Man. And he gives us a great analogy of how man should view himself. And I think I quoted this poem this morning on our Skype Facebook but our Skype chat that is and you might have seen it but for the sake of larger audience let me quote it sometimes when you're feeling important sometime when your egos is is in bloom sometime when you take it for granted you are the best qualified in the room Sometimes when you feel that your going would leave an un inf unfillable hole, just follow these simple instructions and see how they humble your soul. Take a bucket and fill it with water. Put your hand in it up to the wrist. Pull it out and the hole that's remaining is a measure of how you will be missed. You can splash all you wish when you enter. You may stir up the water galore, but stop and you'll find that in no time it looks quite the same as before. The morale of this quaint example is do just the best that you can. Be proud of yourself, but remember there is no indispensable man. Just like we discussed the other night and on our Skype chat, you know, we must never allow the success of preaching of the gospel, especially when we see the statistics of our radio, Hope of Israel, and so on. We must never allow it to get to our heads. We must never allow ourselves to become so proud and so certain to forget that it is God who does his work through us. It's God and only God to whom glory and honor is to be rendered for that, and not us indeed. You know, uh, 
for those of course who live their lives temporally that is an accurate analogy this this wonderful poem there are people yes many people they might have good intentions and purposes but whatever they accomplish in their lives when it is done temporally when it when it is done with a physical end when it is done with a foot in the world brethren it is temporal when the universe passes away when this world ends who will remember but for us in psalm 39 god teaches otherwise he teaches exactly what man is psalm 39 verse 4 lord make me know make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that i may know how frail i am indeed you have made my days as hand breaths and my age is as nothing before certainly every man at his best state is but hevel vapor a breath now we all have known people who have good giving hearts and some that have accomplished a lot in their lifetime and uh, have traits that we wish we had ourselves we admire those people better and yet even today even they even they man at his very best is just temporal and just a breath if we follow the temporal direction of this world even the best in it has to offer we will live a life that is just a vapor if we search out only the good fruits when the israelites were standing at the red sea their god was offering something far beyond the best that man can do second corinthians chapter 4 second corinthians chapter 4 verse 18 while we do not look at the things which are seen the temporal but the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal the greek word for eternal is aeonios the word is the plural of aeon now aeon is the word uh, meaning age the plural means ages or all ages now when you look at the world itself and apply it to time you can see just like creation it's going to end someday again theological dictionary of the new testament says that when this word is used in conjunction with god in the new testament then it means changes it means it's meaning sorry changes and it means eternity in the full sense well we have a couple of scriptures where it is used like in romans 16 25 and 26 now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of jesus christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting god now when we're talking about eternal we're talking about eternity as god knows eternity you know now here is another scripture that uses this world now this word in relation to god first timothy chapter 1 and verse 17 first timothy chapter 1 17 now to the king eternal immortal invisible to god who alone is wise be honor and glory forever and ever amen now while eternal gives the impression that god exists in time aeonius gives the impression that uh, he exists in time as we know it whereas timeless tells us that god does not exist in time the ages the aeons as man knows it now time and space brethren are related and that means they are physical time is physical our god is not he does not exist in anything that is created 
So when we talk about uh, eternity in Second Corinthians chapter four, we're talking outside the frame. Now eternal does not mean living forever in time, but living outside of it. And uh, this thought, what the Theological Dictionary of New Testament also states about uh, Aeon uh, or Aeonis, regarding God, it means without beginning and without end. So when this world is used in regard, what this world is used in regard to God, it means without beginning and without end, what it is applied to uh, man receiving eternal life. It means without end. Now we all had the beginning, but what, what God is holding out, if we, turn, if we turn back and walk toward Him, as the Israelites did when they crossed the Red Sea, and as we do every time we turn and follow God, well, what, what God is holding is life without end, outside of time. What Paul said, the things which God has prepared for us, we cannot even perceive them. We live within time, don't we? Now we think about living forever. <laughs> but think about how God doesn't live in time. If you turn back towards God, you're saying to God, I want to stay in this time. While we have a beginning in time, God is offering uh, to change that. Now, uh, if you turn back toward God, you're saying to God, you know, I want to stay in this time. Now, little did Israelites think that when they were standing on that seashore that they that that was what god was trying to convey to them that is exactly what we need to look at life every every day well let's reread exodus 14 because the lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace and the Lord shall say to you, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Now walking forward, we are reminded that God was offering Israel and us as well to oppor the opportunity to move from temporal to eternal. From Poskairos to Aeonios. But in addition, he is offering it to us in a certain way. Now, go to Exodus chapter 6, please, in verse 5. Exodus chapter 6. And verse 5. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians kept keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out, of, out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. In other words, I will bring you out of this temporal world. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Now, friends, can you picture God reaching out an arm to the house of Israel? Well, he, you know, the arm which would say, well, okay, I know your burdens. I have just nearby wiped out all of army and I want you as mine. Just take my hand. Now, he wasn't going to stop Israel, uh, that is Egyptians. He wasn't going to stop Egypt from turning around. But what he was doing was offering him hand to give Israel and us everything out of his love. And it's not something he was obliged to give. He just wanted Israeli 
to willingly follow him as God in his great power was holding back the Egyptian army and parting the Red Sea he was just saying come I have that lifetime I have that lifeline to eternity but yes Israel struggled to take it as God pointed out later to them just before they entered into the promised land he reminded them in Deuteronomy chapter 4 in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and in Deuteronomy chapter 4 we can start with uh, let me see we can start with verse 32 for you ask now concerning the days that are a past which were before you since the day that God created man on the earth and us from one end of heaven to the other whether any great thing like this has happened or anything like this anything like this uh, has happened did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and live? Verse 34, Deuteronomy 4, verse 34. Or did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm? and by great terrors to all that the Lord your God did you did for you in Egypt before your eyes to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God there is none other besides him one of heavens out of heavens he let you hear his voice that he might instruct you on earth he showed you his great fire and you heard, you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them. And he brought you out of Egypt with his presence, with his mighty power, driving out from beyond as your nations great and mightier than you to bring you, to bring you in, to give you their land, as an inheritance as it is this day now I stretched my arm I did all these things for you your witnesses to all things we're being called we know that Jesus Christ died what does he say about that and what does he say then in verse 39 Well, here we are. Let's go to verse now. To Deuteronomy 5. Because Brother Israel too easily forgot from where they were called and uh, the vast amount of energy there God displayed on their behalf and what it cost to redeem them. Deuteronomy 5.15 And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm so that was the way he did it he was offering them everything freely but then he was not saying oh come on he said here just grab the hand and uh, we are no different than Israel are we brethren we need to remember that God has what God has done for each one of us you know it was the cost of the firstborn of Egypt for the house of Israel for us and all humankind it is the cost of the first born of God our God is holding his outstretched hand ready to lead us forward and our job is to step forward and that's what we did very recently anyway our job is to take hold of God and to confidently and steadfastly walk in faith toward the kingdom towards God without looking back. Please go to Luke 9, verse 62, which teaches us in one parable about the peace. Luke 9, 62 says, But Jesus said to him, No one 
having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, and Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? Is the Lord, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Now our God who calls us with an outstretched hand is faithful and through his power will give us what we need, brethren, to step forward. And we need to step forward. Indeed, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 4 I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by, by him in all utterance and all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, brethren, our God, through his outstretched arm, will see through his power to get us to the other side of the sea. What we must not forget is the many lessons we have learned these past several years as we were deceived about various things, I suppose, great work in Africa, and an open door in Africa. We are to see the end of that now, and it's coming to an end. It seems to be coming into its, into its final stages. So we are to see the end of that now, and remember the lessons, lessons that we should not repeat those same mistakes as we discussed the other day or the other night on, the, on our electronic forum, uh, which is on Skype. So... We need to remember lessons that we should not repeat those same mistakes. Not only mistakes from Africa, but also about how supposedly important we are, being led supposedly by a prophet, supposedly confirmed by various dreams, etc., etc. But in all of that just falls into water now. And that is what is the crescendo of all these events is here. But it's finally coming to an end because what people were doing is temporal. For temporary life, for temporary gain, and so on. They've done great damage to other people in, in that process. But hey, it says in the last days, people will be, you know, without any compassion, and they will be um, harsh, and so on, and so forth. So, one of the lessons to remember is that path that we follow is revealed and directed by our God. Now, how does it... Uh, how, how, how does God do that? Well, he leads us through his path through an outstretched arm. He freed us through great signs, wonders, and with great expense, brethren. The only thing we have, we leave behind is a life that will lead only to pain, burdens, and bondage, the results of which will be only a fleeting temporal moment in life. Now, let's move from our corruptible temporary way of thinking to one of being unleavened, if you wish, incorruptibly and eternal, a way of thinking that leads to a way of life or splendor and a purpose that is timeless. Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Verse 15. In Exodus 14, when the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to do what? Well, go forward, brethren. So let us move, move forward, and let us take God's outstretched hand as we keep moving forward.